This week, we're going to spend some time in Dave's country as we learn a bit about the United Kingdom and spaceflight. And to help us do this, we're joined by the hosts of the award-winning Space Boffins podcast, Sue Nelson and Richard Hollingham. Please keep your comments coming in about what we're doing on this podcast. You can do this via our social media pages at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And please leave a review or if you enjoy what you hear, press the share button. But right now, enjoy episode 138 of the Space and Things podcast. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Charles, and welcome to episode 138 of our podcast. We've got so much to get through today, so let's get started with the main feature. We've been talking about doing this for a while, and we've also talked about doing something similar for a number of other countries. So this can be the first in a series, a series which we've not got any firm plans for any other episodes, but it will happen. So when the European Space Agency... ESA, announced its latest class of astronauts. There were three UK names. Rosemary Coogan will be the UK's third ever astronaut after Tim Peake and Helen Sharman. John McFall was selected as an astronaut with a physical disability and Megan Christian will join the ESA Astronaut Reserve. At a similar time, Tim Peake announced his retirement from ESA to become a space ambassador for the UK and ESA. Astronauts are the figurehead for any space programme, But there's also a lot of other things happening in the UK with spaceports being built and rocket launches from the UK soil not too far away from becoming reality. In a survey carried out by Bryce Tech in 2021, it was announced that UK space-related organizations produced 16.5 billion pounds in income for the 2019-2020 tax year. And since 2012, the population of space organizations has grown on average nearly 21% per annum. So we wanted to talk to some top UK space journalists to help us understand a little bit more about what's been going on and what will be going on. So we asked the Space Boffins to join us. It's a monthly podcast which hosts some amazing interviews and in-depth knowledge of what is going on in space. And it was the winner of the Sir Arthur C. Clarke Award for Space Media. We spoke to Sue Nelson a few weeks back when we had our podcast about Wally Funk. And this time we're joined by her Space Boffin co-host, Richard Hollingham. So this interview was recorded before we found out that Virgin Orbit had in fact gone bankrupt. At the time we recorded it, it was going through financial problems and things were put on hold, but it hadn't been declared bankrupt. So although Virgin Orbit isn't a British company... It had built a spaceport or a spaceport had been built for it to fly from the UK, which we're going to talk about. We're also going to talk about those Virgin Orbit problems. Anyway, let's hear from the Space Boffins all about the past, present and future of the UK space program. Houston, Space and Things Base here. Dave and Emily have landed. Welcome back, Sue, and welcome, Richard, to Space and Things. It's great to have the two of you with us today. So... If you don't mind, give us a little bit of background about the UK in space before the 1990s. Wasn't there a rocket program at one point and weren't payload specialists from the UK supposed to go on the space shuttle? Yes, to all the above. Um, (laughs) I mean, you can trace that the UK's history in space really back to the end of the Second World War. After the capture of the the V-2 rockets, uh, Von Braun's V-2 rockets, the UK had, had some of them. So they went to uh, the US, Russia got what bits they could, Britain had what bits they could, and the UK also had a, a you know a massive aviation industry. I mean, Britain invented the jet engine. We had yeah. the first commercial passenger plane, a jet passenger plane. So, you know, there was an extraordinary time in the 50s. It looked like the UK could be a, a leader in space. And it kind of all fizzled out. In a very British way. We're (laughs) we're so used to hopes raised and then hopes crushed. And then we keep a (laughs) stiff upper lip about it. Uh, So in the 60s, you had a a series of satellite launches with NASA that the UK did. So the UK was one of the first countries to get a satellite into space, albeit with 
a, a foreign partner. Yeah, they they did that from Woomera, didn't they? In, no, in that's Austria. different. Oh, that's so a coming to one. that. Oh, I'm, yeah. I do. I've I've uh, peaked too soon. Yeah. Sorry. So we had the aerial <laughs> series of satellites in the sixties with NASA, and then so yes, this is the UK's biggest uh, claim to fame in space history. It's the only country to have successfully developed a rocket to launch a satellite into orbit, done that, and then abandoned the program. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, it's extraordinary. <laughs> I love yeah. Emily's eyes. Sort of, were almost as wide as your glasses frames. Then <laughs> I was laughing because I'm like, that's very British. Like, you know, <laughs> it is. Yeah. Oh, we did it once. Let's just let's just walk yeah. away from. It. Like, what? <laughs> the thing. Well, there are lots of things about this, and it, it becomes the more you look into it, the more understandable it becomes. So, the reason it was cancelled. I mean, this all comes down to money. You know, mm -hmm. the U.S. has a ton of money. The Soviet Union had a huge amount of money put into space, at least initially. The UK does not or did not have a lot of money and space was not at that point a massive priority. So they developed this fantastic launcher, but it was a launcher for launching small satellites. And the thing is, in the early 70s, there really weren't any small satellites. There wasn't the need for small satellites. If you invented that rocket now, it would be brilliant. So, you know, they did that. have those sounding rockets, though, didn't they? Yeah. Which I know they've been quite, very, I know they've been very successful. Those, yeah. yeah. And the other choice at that point, the government had only a certain amount of money. This is the 1970s. Uh, mm -hmm. UK economy was in big trouble. Choice between a space rocket program to launch small satellites when no one really wanted to launch small satellites or a commercial aviation program to develop a supersonic airliner, Concorde. And they went with Concorde. Of course, now, looking back, it's all too easy to say they should have gone with rockets because no one's flying in Concorde anymore. But that was the ch that was the choice that was made. And to answer your final bit of your question. I wondered when you were going to yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so Brits did, military Brits uh, did train for the space shuttle. They were going to fly and then the Challenger disaster happened and ah. that was all, all abandoned. That was again to launch uh, British satellites, the Skynet, the fantastically the Skynet. named <laughs> Skynet satellites, British communication, uh, military communication satellites were going to be launched from the space shuttle. So Brits trained as um, engineers on the space shuttle. They were going to fly into space and of course, never happened. So the 1990s saw the first British woman in space, Helen Sharman. Uh, since then, Tim Peake has flown aboard the ISS. Now, uh, recently, ISA has debuted uh, new British astronauts, including the first astronaut with a disability. So what will human spaceflight look for the United Kingdom, you think, in, in the future years? Well, I think when you look at the impact, particularly that Tim Peake had on yeah. the UK when he went into space, the UK Space Agency had a, a sort of a massive program of interactive activities with schools across the UK, whether it was speaking before and during his space flight. So, in fact, we went to one of them because one of those activities took place in our son's school, didn't it? Oh, Where they, they um, did a radio broadcast effectively. You know, what's that thing? With, that, that it was really, ham radio. Ham radio, yeah, that's the, the thing. To yeah, the to, to the yeah. ISS to try and talk to. And I, and I went to another one at a school in London where um, he was talking to a school as he was coming by. And the programs were incredible. And the impact, um, the UK Space Agency did look afterwards at the impact it had had. And it was massive in terms of encouraging younger people to go into STEM and STEM subjects. I think Helen Sharman, the sort of infrastructure at the time, it just wasn't quite the same. And because of the way her mission was, which that, you know, there wasn't the UK Space Agency, it was the British National Space Centre anyway. It was a private company. It was done with the, the Russians. And if it wasn't for the, the well, Russians... Well, it still it actually the, so, it's still actually the Soviet, Soviet Union, Union at yeah. that point. So, mm. so it, it, was a, it was a very different type of mission. And so while people like me remember it and were very excited, I think for a, a younger generation, it didn't have the same impact be simply because there wasn't that backing of the agency to actually let people know and make it a sort of educational scheme. And it, this was shown in the fact that, I mean, this they, they're excruciatingly embarrassed about this and say it was a mistake. But the, when the UK Space Agency issued a press release about Tim Peake going into space, they called him the first 
first Britain in space. And, you know, a lot of people, including myself, you know, nearly choked on or whatever we were eating or drinking at the time, time. It was just like, what? And they'd totally forgotten that actually, yes, there had been another Brit in space before then. Uh, so much has changed actually in the yeah. last few years. And I think, like, you know, just to connect back to what we were talking about with the Prospero satellite, they, I mean, they used to say that the UK space industry, well, I used to say, I think some other people used to say, it, it was a success despite government. Because, you know, the, the commercial satellite industry in the UK is, is massive. Before Elon Musk and, uh, and SpaceX, the, the UK was one of the, the largest manufacturers, you know, in terms of sheer numbers of satellites, one of the largest in the world. Still is. Significant number of satellites around the Earth are made in the UK. But when it came to human spaceflight, the government was not interested. I mean, apart from those, those shuttle astronauts. Then we had Helen Sharm, and that was, I mean, it was at very different times. But with Tim Peake and now with the space agency, I mean, you know, astronauts, uh, you know, it's because they're right at the center of everything. It, it's extraordinary. I, I used to edit a magazine called Space UK, which was for the British National Space Center, which became the UK Space Agency. And when I started doing it, very much a, a magazine of government, but I was brought in to try and make it zing a bit. But I wasn't allowed, even though this was aimed at schools, wasn't allowed to put rockets in it or astronauts because the UK <laughs> didn't do rockets or astronauts. Now, of course, the UK, all it wants to talk about in space is rockets and astronauts. So it's changed absolutely completely. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, to answer your question, we keep going slightly off piece here. It will have a huge impact on the UK again to see somebody. It's the usual thing, isn't it? It was Sally Ride, wasn't it? If you don't see it, you can't be it. And it's the same. And when you think about it, you can go into space and be somebody who might require a wheelchair on Earth because you're going to be in microgravity. It's, it's going to be fine. And uh, yeah, I think I think it, it, it's uh, especially brilliant. He's so well qualified. I'm sure you did the same as me. You know, you immediately start looking up all their CVs because you, well, I do, I want to judge myself by them Absolutely. and to see whether I could have got in. And the answer every time is, well, hell no. Yeah. Um, because these are like the NASA lot and like the Artemis crew. They're like superhuman beings. They don't just yeah. have one degree, you know, that's for wusses. They have two. They don't just know how to mountain climb. No, they can dive. They've got the record for this. They can ski. The, they are are amazing and the Isolot are just the same. Yeah. I felt like reading the Artemis people, you just think, wow, they're the best of us. And that's, you know, so yeah, it will be massive here. Well, I think, I mean, Rosemary Coogan, who was uh, selected as the British European Space Agency astronaut from the new selection, very good chance she will end up on the moon. I mean, yeah, you know, crazy. a British astronaut on the moon. Very good chance of that. Um, and John McFall, who we were talking about before the, um, what, they, what they've sort of called the para-astronaut. Um, he was a Paralympian. And I, I, mean, I think with, with him, it'd be really interesting. I think the, the issue will be more the getting to space rather than being in space. Um, mm. I remember talking to Luca Palmitano, one of the Easter astronauts, and he was saying in space, it was just his legs he just found really annoying because <laughs> they just got in the way. He'd, what he'd really like is four hands. <laughs> to move around. So actually being in space, really not an issue. I think the issues really are around safety in terms of getting in and out of a spacecraft emergencies, those, sort, those sorts of things, which is part of what this program is meant to, meant to address. Obviously, Tim Peake's got his new role now as an ambassador. And well, I, I'm, I'm assuming you've both read or listened to Limitless, uh, his book, but obviously he had a huge role in pushing the UK government into getting funding into ESA for human spaceflight. Are we excited by Tim Peake's continuing involvement? I mean, it's great, isn't it? But equally, are we also upset that he's no longer part of the astronaut corps? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a real shame he's not, he's chosen. I mean, it's obviously it's his choice because mm. he was an exceptional a, a oh, astronaut. Yeah. Everyone you hear, both at NASA and at ESA, they all talk about him and NASA really rated him. Yeah. I was in the, um, it's the science sort of mission control. It's, it's one of these hidden mission controls at Huntsville, Alabama, Marshall yeah. Space Flight Center. And I was actually there when he was, he was on the space station and they were all singing his praises. 
and I can't remember the second name of the other astronaut, but he was also called the, Tim. The two Tims. And it was the it? Tims. And yeah. they said that, you know, yeah. the Tims C- Copra, worked really well together. The that Tims. Was it. Yes, yes, yeah. Copra. Yeah. So the Tims were considered a unit on the space station at the time. Had an outstanding mission. You know, astronauts always work to these timelines. Tim Peake was always ahead of his timeline. I think his, mm. his military background helped. Yeah. He's been a brilliant communicator. So I, I think it's a real shame that he's not got another mission. And I think also his mission broke through internationally as well. You know, and I, th- I think it helps perhaps in that respect being being British. So I think that's a shame. I think as an ambassador for space, he's fantastic. And he's obviously, you know, I don't know what his reasons are for, for well, stepping back. Some of but, them you know. are probably just normal human being yeah. ones. He's got teenage children. Kids, yeah. How much of your life do you want to give up for that? You would. Being, <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> Des- <laughs> I'll give you up. But um, deskbound, you know, is much better for personal reasons and relationships. And I thought it was really interesting when you looked at the new ESA recruits, how young they were. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's... And then you start to think, oh, actually, people like Tim Peake and Samantha Christopheretti, they're by no means old, but compared to those, (laughs) you know, young people. I mean, obviously, by the time they do finish all their training... Realistically... It's gone, but there is that too. Would Tim have got back to the moon? No. And the answer is possibly no. not. Realistically, his next mission would have been another six-month stint on the International Space Station, doing more or less the same things as he did before. Although he did, I mean, both of us have met him loads of times, and he he did want to go to the moon. He was but without I think, a doubt. I think it'll be the next class of, of astronauts that will go to the moon. I mean, possibly the only ESA astronaut with a chance of going to the moon, um, current one, not the new trainees, would be uh, Matthias uh, Maurer because he's leading the European Space Agency's moon facilities and sort of moon efforts. So, right. you know, he might be the one, if if not one of the new ones. If you've done all that, if you've been, it would be a sort of retread, perhaps, of what and, he's and done already. And at the already. moment, as you'll know, Dave, Tim's, you know, currently doing this UK tour where he's he's gone around loads of different cities where he's spreading the word about... Mm space he's also like releasing books and and fiction i think like a yeah. young adult book which um i'm sure he wrote every word or is it done with another person yeah i, I with <laughs> thanks to i think with thanks to <laughs> oh yeah those key key <laughs> words uh, oh, i'm dissing tim here aren't i because it must be difficult it's like you know i know everyone said this about the apollo astronauts and it's not so much today because you do get to go back and go back and go back if you're lucky but it still must be difficult to, to come back to Earth and, it, it's and get harder used to, go, to it. I mean, it's but hard, I think yeah. now uh, astronauts find themselves in other forms and other ways and other careers. Some of them go back to, to engineering, like Mike Massimino, mm. and others like Nicole Stott will be involved in art and and that lovely space art foundation and and her, yeah, you know, and I, what have I you. Think, it's yeah. finding your way, and I think he's found his way. He's done this amazing communication job with the UK public in particular and school kids really really love him it, but he's also yeah. now he is a good he is a good ambassador he will be mm. fabulous and I just hope he's got plenty of Ferrero Rocher <laughs> oh, <the ambassador laughs> only, yeah, only, maybe only British very niche very niche yeah. Yeah. So I made that joke with someone recently and they didn't get it and I was like oh god <laughs> <laughs> showing my age now aren't I <laughs> yes, yes. But I think the other thing to bear in mind with this, if you're an astronaut, it's going to get better, but not uh, not right now. There are few, very few opportunities to get into space. Yeah. I'm just reading um excellent book, and I can't... Uh, Meredith... Meredith Bagby. Been yeah, about it, Meredith yeah. Bagby. Yeah. Um, the, the new guy's book. And I'd sort of skim, skim read it before I interviewed her, and um, read it properly now, I'm reading it properly now. You realise there are quite a few astronauts back in the, the 1980s and there were so many opportunities. And every time they flew the space shuttle, seven astronauts yeah. went up into space. In the early 80s, before the Challenger disaster, they were flying multiple missions every year in the space shuttle. You needed a lot of astronauts. So every astronaut was bl- there was flying three, possibly four, four missions. And then mm. you had the Soviet Union, like the, the Russians flying as well. There's really not the opportunities now with these six months missions to the to the ISS getting there in a Dragon or a, or a Soyuz until we start seeing maybe more 
private flights, as you know, Elon Musk has already already flown, but we see maybe more of those. There actually aren't the opportunities with the space agencies to fly frequently, and maybe Tim Peake will fly again, but on a on a private mission at some point. Yeah, let's hope so. I think I think it'd be great to see him go up again. I'm not giving up hope that he goes to the moon either. Maybe it'll be some kind of private <laughs> thing, but I don't want to give up hope because I'd like to see him up there. So the UK is also home now to new spaceports. So what are they and how are they expected to invigorate British space programs? Well, the spaceport in Cornwall, uh, which actually both of us have, have been to, it's an airport. Right. Okay, it's his new key airport in Cornwall, which was used to be a, a military base. Actually, yeah, so, all so the it's sort got of Cold this War massive, bunkers, and that's so. one of the reasons it was selected, particularly for the Virgin Orbit stuff, is because it's got, I think, one of the longest runways in the UK, so that you can actually use it for for it. I think it was it was for yeah for military aircraft, and didn't they? have it at one point for some emergency landing for it was it was other... one of the listed um emergency airbase i think for the space shuttle that was actually. it so yeah. that's yeah. why it was so, wow. reach orbit, so long could go there. um richard's been there more recently than i have when i was there a couple of years ago it was literally just a lot of excitement a few porter cabins and and the builders in ready to to sort of set it all up and it was it was amazing this juxtaposition of everyone getting excited about this new new buildings and that this is where our offices are going to be and they're going to be here and then all of a sudden you'd see a world war ii hangar next to it yeah so it was a, a crazy uh, mix and the fact that people are arriving in cornwall to go on their holiday because it's a well-known <laughs> yeah. sea surf and yes yeah, it's, it's a sort of you know new keys a surfer town um mm. cornwall is a you know holiday mm. big holiday industry I suppose my fear, my worry about Spaceport Cornwall, let me tell you what's good about it first. They've actually built some infrastructure. So there's big, I mean, really seriously big size um, clean rooms for the integration of putting the satellites into the top of the, the rocket. Um, it's impressive. They've got the involvement, and, and this will happen anyway, of Goon Hilly, which is this major ground station. It was involved in oh, the moon landings, yeah, yeah, broadcasting moon landings, Telstar, first, you know, TV satellite. So it's been involved in all these, you know, these big things. They're going to a big ground station nearby. So that's all there. What my worry is that they had this first launch and it failed to reach orbit with Virgin Orbit. My worry is they've put all their eggs in the basket of Virgin Orbit because there aren't many other, well, there are no other right now viable alternatives that are doing these these air-launched uh, rockets like Virgin Orbit. And as we know, Virgin Orbit is, well, it's, it's the whole, as a business, it's it's effectively on hold right now. So, you know, we'll we'll see what happens. Hopefully, they'll come back and, tr and try again because there were a lot of really neat small satellites packed into that that launcher. So it'd be and sad if it doesn't happen. that's where the Scotland one probably may have the edge, which you didn't, you know, if somebody had said, who's going to get everything up first, you'd say, well, of course, we'll go for Cornwall because they're doing horizontal takeoff and, and landing and it's a modified 747. So, of course, though, that's going to get up and running soon. So it hasn't quite gone according to plan. And I was sat at a table in Bristol Science Museum uh, space Museum or Science and Space Museum, underneath, funnily enough, a Concorde um, and all the tables <laughs> were underneath the car to accept an award on behalf of uh, Wally Funk. And sat on my table was um, the guy who was in charge of the Scotland um, spaceport. Oh, very I nice. I wish I could tell you his first name, but I was obsessed by his second name <laughs> because I'm a big Star Trek fan and it was Kirk. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's just like it's these little details that stick yeah. in my head. And what he was saying, I was saying, oh, come on, is it going to be a while? Is it going to be ages? And he said, oh, no. He said, we're, we'll be ready to go within in months. It's going to go in very quickly. And they will be doing vertical uh, launches there. It's in the middle of, it's it's the highlands. So there are two, yeah. yeah there's, there's the one in Sutherland, right at the top. If you look at mm. mainland UK, go right to the top. It's Sutherland, tip of Scotland. And that's where they launch. So launch into polar orbit from there because there's basically nothing beyond that. Just yeah, <laughs> that's right. You know, um, maybe you know. So it's there's yes, yeah, there's just ocean and ice. So you know, you can go up from there. So it's pretty much perfect. So that's likely to happen. There's a, a rival one on uh, the Shetland Islands as well. Different company. 
are also looking to launch, you know, rockets vertically. So it will be interesting. What, yeah. I mean, one of these is going to succeed. Uh, and it's just so incredible to me that we're actually talking about rockets launching to orbit from the UK. And that just seems mm. such an amazing thing. And if you know, if you well, said Scot that 10 years ago, and, and a lot no of it, way. Scotland has got this massive sort of space base uh, in Glasgow and, and in particular, because we've been to Clyde Space and they're, they're just amazing. And there Not are quite a, yeah. a few companies there. It's a Skyora. Isn't Skyora yeah. also based in Glasgow? Yeah, I think they're in the same yeah. building, actually. Yeah, they're all, you know, a lot, lot of there. lot of small satellite companies. So there's, there's a lot of satellites waiting to be launched. And so there's a demand there for more and more launches because I mean, right now with, you know, not able to use a, a rush, any Russian launches, you know, everyone is just descending on SpaceX to launch. And it, I think it'd be good for SpaceX to have some competition. What rockets are they planning on using their own ones? Or, or are these going to be other already industry use rockets? It's a very good question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the detail and I probably should have researched the detail. Some of it is. They went to Rockets R Us. Yeah. <laughs> some of it's one out, off the yeah. shelf. <laughs> One of them is it's a it's a rocket company building a right. building a rocket, and actually, you know, a lot of it's going. You know, I mentioned Prospero, which was launched on this Black Arrow back in the early seventies. Some of the technology is based on that because Britain knows how to build small rocket launchers. So it's actually going back and taking some of those designs. The other one is more an international one, and I can't remember the the companies off the off the top of my head. One is more or less a Scottish rocket launching from Scotland. So I mean that that's pretty pretty cool. And you can bet that if it's a success, it'll be a British rocket. Uh, and if it's a failure, it'll, it'll be, be a, a Scottish <laughs> rocket. <laughs> no, the other way around. If it's a success, no, it's, it'll be a Scottish rocket. If it it's depends a, where you are. failure, it'll be a British yeah, rocket. Yeah, it depends yeah. where you are. Geographically, yeah, it if you're in terrible. Scotland, it'll be yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The old Andy Murray syndrome. <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But everyone was so excited about Cornwall. You know, I went down. Um, we actually made a lovely with a colleague of mine, um, a lovely promotional film about launching horizontally from Cornwall and Spaceport Cornwall and Cornwall and this sort of space cluster in Cornwall. Um, and then it all... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's a shame. It was a really nice, really nice film. But I was genuinely <laughs> impressed with what they're doing, with what they're doing down in Cornwall. But we, we I need think to go up to Scotland yeah, now, don't we? I think because a lot Scotland's, of, Scotland, it's like cat yeah. and mouse, really, isn't it? Or, or the tortoise and the hare. The tortoise and they the were hare. definitely the, the <laughs> tortoise. And now they're, they're coming up really close. I have to close. say, a lot of it's slightly under the radar at the moment. But I think we're going to hear hear a lot more as things start to, to roll out. I mean, the great thing is, I think people still think of rockets and launch pads and things as Cape Canaveral, you know, with a huge, great gantry and some sort of crawler transporter taking some giant rocket out to the Britain, to the Britain will be in a little trolley. They'll just use yeah. a shopping trolley from Tesco's or something. They'll just pop the stuff in. There'll be a little car park. There might be, I don't know, a burger, a little burger joint or something. Haggis, maybe, if you're in Scotland. A couple of whiskeys afterwards. Yeah, I think it'd be quite low key. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, a concrete launch pad. But yeah. That's fine. What I'm saying is, you don't need a huge amount of infrastructure anymore. You know, these are much smaller. The satellites they're launching are much smaller. You just need a, a concrete pad and a, and a hangar. You don't yeah. need this huge. You don't need a massive mission control. That, you can that's do it all what off I a... really noticed the difference when um, Richard and I both went in 1999. We both went to Kourou in French Guiana to watch uh, an Ariane four launch and it and it was fabulous and it was just really brilliant and we were really quite close weren't we we were yeah probably about, too close yeah, I would say. yeah yeah we're only about a mile away from <laughs> that thing but it was it was great the view was fantastic the feel was amazing that you know that raw that gut feeling and it was a night launch it was fantastic and everywhere the the wine was flowing. It's very very French. It was a, it was the French in the European space, isn't it? but well, it was so to... French and French Guiana. So much alcohol and every Easter thing we used to go to as well. It was always like you know, oh, this is a great launch. It doesn't more wine, oh, and, and that's the difference yeah. I think between um, NASA. And ESA, but sadly, ESA have got more like Oh, I don't know. Now. I used to, I went, because I used it's to do not the. As, um, not as much wine. I used to do the commentaries from uh, Mission Control Moscow for European astronauts to the ISS um, until a few years ago. And obviously, they're not going to happen now for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But in Mission Control, after a successful launch, it's not just the champagne, it's the vodka. Vodka, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's extraordinary. You know, and I'll carry the, on doing my shift yeah, after another yeah, few Yeah, Absolutely, absolutely <laughs> extraordinary. Very different attitude. Uh, 
from there to it. But uh, yeah, I do miss those um, those post-launch parties in in uh, Moscow Mission Control. And, and of course, good. Britain have been affected by um, obviously when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, that put a big dampener on what was to be Europe's first Mars rover. Yeah, uh, it's called Rosalind uh, now. And um, that was suddenly put on hold, you know, at the ExoMars mission. They had their trace gas orbiter. You know, the rover was waiting for the, the, the second mission in those. But a few days ago, I'm quite delighted because I, well, both of us, we actually live very close to um, an Airbus in Stevenage, which has the Mars yard, which made these rovers. Yeah, so, so we I'll, I'll, go the, there a lot. Yeah, so the, the rover was made about 10 miles away yeah, from where 10 we're, miles. So we where go we there a lot. And in fact, um, I took Wally Funk there as a, as a little <laughs> trip, you know, to, nice. to keep her happy, and give her a little fun time where she tried to ride one of the prototype <laughs> rovers and had to, be, <laughs> rovers had to be told, no, you can't. You know, these things cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. <laughs> it's like, get off, get off. No, you can't climb on it. And you think, oh my goodness, all this work, you know, it's taken them years and years of development and work and, and it looked like it was gone and then a few days ago it looks like it's back on no ExoMars is being re-envisioned visioned if I can say it correctly and I think that's they're going to redesign <laughs> vision, they're going to redesign the Rosalind Franklin and there'll be no Russian involvement this okay. time but it's just so great that something made in the UK fingers crossed still has a chance to uh, land on Mars other than Beagle 2 which as we know did land on Mars and uh, sadly didn't fully work on arrival because one of the solar panels not opening. Yeah, yeah. But it probably did work it just didn't tell anyone it was working because <laughs> yeah. the solar panel was covering the, the transmitter. It was interesting that you just said about how ESA used to be quite wine heavy in Russia and vodka. I was, mm. I was at Mission Control in, in Houston recently and while I was there observing from the room at the back, a load of pizzas got brought in. That's how America do it. They bring in the pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, it, is, it is great. I mean, I do think, you know, on... Well, I, I mean, Gotta get the domino. <laughs> As mission controls go, I, I think Houston takes some yeah. some beating. Although the Russian mission control, if you've ever seen it on uh, TV, and I mean it's it's in use now. I mean they they are it's a parallel in terms of systems and everything. It looks very different, but it's in parallel to to Houston. If Houston goes down or their maintenance or whatever, they'll swap over to um, mission control Moscow. Mission control Moscow essentially controls the Russian side of the International Space Station. But that's almost like a very Grand, it's a grand theatre. One mm. of those old cinemas before they made the multiplexes, just an enormous cinema with a balcony and these curtains and this huge screen at the front and then the floor, which has these banks uh, and really quite old fashioned sort of banks. They're now PCs, but they are where the consoles used to be of Mission Control. Very grand wood panelled room. So it is definitely, you know, Mission Control wise, it's pretty good. Whereas, Wouldn't it be nice you know, if we had one though? I know, I know we won't. It, the mission control will be tiny, won't but it? But you can operate it all off a MacBook Pro. <laughs> well, you this, know, you got the thing, well, this is it, it, actually. That's not true because we have been, when we were at Clyde Space, they said, well, this is where we operate all our satellites. And it was literally a little office with, with a little laptop, wow. a couple of laptops and a few. <laughs> so yeah, because you don't need... It's just very, yeah. it's underwhelming. But yeah. at the same time, it's impressive when you think that everything now can be done on a much smaller scale. And let's face it, that's what the UK is. We do sm space on a much smaller scale. But um, thankfully, we can still pack a punch, I think. Yeah, it, it's some pretty good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't mind, I'd like to quickly go back to the Virgin Orbit story. Um, obviously, uh, it doesn't look too good there at the moment. And Virgin Galactic, the sister company, we haven't heard much from them. They're, they're on hold at the moment as well. How difficult is it for these space companies at the moment? And is that going to affect a lot of things in the UK? I mean, we've been we, we've been around the Virgin Orbit factory in Long Beach, California. I have to say, I I was oh, very it's impressed. So impressive! It was yeah. very impressive what they were doing, and lots of innovative technology. Lots of you know using three D printers and the like to to make components for for space. I think the demand is clearly there. You know, the the UK is churning out small satellites, 
And there are not enough launches around. We're seeing it actually with the European Space Agency even. It's Ariane 6 rocket is delayed. Mm. They're running out, they've run out of Ariane 5 rockets. So it's major mission Euclid launching in the summer is going to be on a on a SpaceX, SpaceX yeah. which wow. is so unusual for the European Space Agency because mm. essentially you know the Ariane program is it's about Europe and it's a, about sovereignty and it's about having the ability to make spacecraft and launch them but you know the UK is churning out these small satellites and there are definitely a demand for launch but the issue is really the I think it's the it's the economy as you said it's always a bit of a risky business anyway. It's a competitive business. You know, the UK has gone through austerity. We've yeah. gone through three years of, of a pandemic. We're in a cost of living <laughs> crisis. So, so many businesses are, have folded and often the ones you least expect to. And I remember being struck when we were at, what's the name of that brilliant spaceport with the woman with the office and you look through and she, there's a runway. Mojave. Mojave, yes, yeah, sorry. Mojave Air and Space, that, that sort of spaceport. And I remember when we were going there and we, we saw all these company names and loads of them that were big names at the time, just sort of 10 years earlier, we think, oh, that's gone out of business. Oh, that's gone out of business. Oh, that's yeah. no longer in business. But you, then you also saw others were like, oh, that's new. That's yeah. new. And I think that's where the, the UK yeah, is. It's, it's a tricky, it's tricky yeah, at the best of times. I have time. to say, I've got form on this. I made a radio program a good few years ago now for, um, for Radio 4, big speech uh, domestic uh, station here for the BBC. Um, went to Mojave and I was really impressed with a company that's now lost to history, x -Core, and their space plane as opposed to the Virgin Galactic space plane because I thought the X-Core one was pretty nippy it could go straight from the runway up into, oh, up wow. into space it looked mm. great it had lots of ex-NASA engineers well X-Core is just you yeah. know it's an empty hangar now but Virgin Galactic you know the worry is I mean that's still <laughs> that's on hold still as well not yeah. gone up so yes it it is worrying but I think the only thing you can sort of think is that there will be others waiting to and it will I, be who you probably again who you least expect it's yeah it's, it, it's in, the economics of it are interesting i i was at a space company another small satellite company in the uk i won't i won't name them but you know there are lots you know there are lots of small satellite companies in the uk they only use spacex because spacex is by order of magnitude cheaper and more reliable than other space companies yeah so trying to crack that as another space launch and also that yeah it's it is the cost for a lot yeah. of lot of people i've had several space scientists say that to me is oh my goodness that's so much cheaper so there's going to be a very competitive yeah, one, and, and whoever can, gets going here in the uk it may well come down to cost and it's a murky well. market because you can go on the spacex website you can you know type in a few things you can t they'll tell you the price which they'll is give you the so price. unusual they'll give you a quote because you try and find out what the gym my local gym charges each person <laughs> and you cannot. It is so diffuse. But you can find out how much it costs to launch a satellite with SpaceX. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. But you, this has always been opaque. The launch market's always been opaque. You kind of, there are lots of middle people doing deals where they'll get you a launch or they'll get you a ride share on an Indian rocket or a Russian rocket or uh, from Japan. But, you know, SpaceX is such a disruptor of the market. And for so many space companies, it's the cheapest and the most reliable. But there's an awful lot of satellites waiting for launch. So there is, there's plenty of room for competition, but they've got to really compete against SpaceX. Yeah, the da danger is we'll end up with a monopoly with just, and they'll just back their prices up because they would have run everyone else, else well, out of the business. That's how but, most businesses yeah, work, yeah, sadly, right? though, isn't it? It's a very interesting time because there's a, a huge, you know, it's because satellites are, are piling up almost yeah. literally. You know, I know, tell you any number of space companies in the UK that's waiting, waiting for launch. The fact that ESA is having to go to SpaceX as well to launch one of its major scientific missions. So there's definitely a market there for more launches. And where Juice will be, where's Juice going? Juice up? Ariane 5, one Ariane of the last five, Ariane 5. That's the last Ariane 5. No, yeah. not quite the last, apparently. There's, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, there's going to be But there's one. not okay. enough for, for Euclid, so they've not built any more. East has had its own problems with its Vega launches, the yeah. recent failure with um, the Vega launch. So there's a huge demand there, but there just aren't the rockets available right now and not at the right price for most, uh, most satellite companies. 
So what will general space flight and not just human space flight? What do you think it'll look like in 10 years for the UK or, or 20 years? What do you guys think? I'm the optimist. Rich is a bit more glass half empty. I Realist, think, but we'll I think see. No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I think okay, yeah. I see regular launches from Cornwall and Scotland. So we have vertical and horizontal launches. We have a, a thriving, we will have a thriving business in, they'll be mostly scientific, small satellites. And I also see flying cars eventually <laughs> happening. So yeah, it's going to be great. I do think it's going to be huge. The The issue will be, and um, which we touched on at the beginning, government. Mm. You know, you need a government that backs this here. More so, I think, probably in the UK than than the States, maybe. It, it's just so a, a I'm going to sound thing. actually more optimistic than you are. Because I, the government <laughs> here is, you know, and successive governments, whatever political hue, uh, have been are serious about space. And they've put a reasonable amount of money into space as well. What's interesting is... Everyone at the space agency and the narrative coming out of the UK space agency right now is the lunar economy. So, you know, the UK is building, and it already has contracts with NASA and ESA, communication satellites to provide comms from the moon for, you know, Artemis missions, for future commercial missions. The UK is looking at providing navigation services for the moon. Because we do these things, we're really good at satellites, so why not provide those space services for the moon and these commercial operations with some government money and they're put involved into them. in the gateway aren't they as well yeah so the gateway the nasa mm. the nasa project you know only um i think it was yesterday there was uh the uk's putting money into um to rolls royce for modular yeah. nuclear reactors that could be used on the moon mm. so the uk is seeing that the lunar economy as a as a potential growth area which is really interesting you know it's the uk that's building the communication satellites for the moon and Goon Hilly in Cornwall is going to be the ground station for that. Amazing. And I also, in 10 years' time, I'm pretty certain that there'll be a UK-born astronaut, astronaut on the moon. on the moon, yeah. yeah. So it's, gosh, it's, it's very exciting. <laughs> it is very exciting. We've had a question from Lauren, who's one of our Patreon subscribers. Now, this is a complete change of tack from where we've been so far. <laughs> <laughs> so... She says, I'm traveling to the UK in June and was wondering if you have any recommendations for places to visit if you're interested in space. Oh, yes. Well, there's the obvious one, which would be the National Space Centre in Leicester or the Science Museum in London, which has a fantastic gallery. But I personally love the high down on the Isle of Wight. Yeah. It's a National Trust property, which normally has like stately homes and, you know, jam and teas. But yeah. This one doesn't. This has where um, they used to test the um, UK rocket yeah, um, so engines the, um, the, oh, wow. for the, the UK built launches that were, were being devised in the 70s, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, if you've got time, it's a beautiful area as well because it's the needles on the Isle of Wight. So spectacular yeah. views. And the Isle of Wight's are quite an interesting place. And that's place the anyway. island for, for Laura. And the Isle of Wight is the island off the bottom of um, the UK, the bottom of England. So you'd get a train from London down south get a ferry over there, stay over. It's a, it's a, say it's a pretty little island. And the, so you get amazing views of the coast, but you also see these Rocket bunkers all, all preserved yeah. and, and the, the launch pads across this, you know, this incredible view yeah. with France far off in the distance. And not space, but I'm guessing she probably likes planes as well. I would say... Duxford. Duxford. Um, du museum. Yeah, museum <laughs> at Duxford. There's not much space stuff in there. I think it's a Polaris missile, which is sort mm. of space, but it's just brilliant. It's one of the, I would yeah. say, it's a, it's a world class aviation museum. So, yeah, not strictly speaking space, but. You've uh, gone off brief. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you can go off brief. No, you space know. and yeah. things will take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a thing. Oh, it's yeah. a thing. Yeah. Well, if you're on things, the National Railway Museum in New York <laughs> yeah, is really um, good. Transport generally. But uh, yeah, ducks, ducks were definitely, definitely worth a visit. But yeah, Sue's right. I think the Isle of Wight is such a quirky, odd place to go and not many people go there it's to that particular well, area well, high down history. on the Isle of Wight. And it's such a fascinating bit of yeah rocket history. You can actually go in the bunker. And I'm you sure. could also go to um, Imperial College London, which is right next door to the Science Museum. Hang round, out round there, and she might bump into our first astronaut, Helen Sharman. Amazing. Helen's a, uh, a lecturer there. 
Yeah. So That's I would say when it comes to space, you know, there's no Johnson Space Center or um, Smithsonian Air and Space Museum or anything like that, but the quirkier stuff. The quirky stuff. Yeah. Isle of Wight is, is just... Uh, Isle of Wight and Duxford. Yeah. Right. Now let's talk a little bit about the Space Boffins podcast. Finally, uh, long <laughs> final question for you. I think people have you might anything... have lost interest in that by now. <laughs> uh, no, no, definitely not. Is anything exciting coming up that you've got planned or are we just going to stick to this monthly format and we have to wait and see? Yeah, well, I, I don't know how you two managed to do a weekly one, quite frankly. It's um, uh, it's incredible because it is, it is a lot of work and it's a, a lot of... Thought yeah, it's amazing. It. We've been doing it almost 12 years now. Yeah, and there have been several points but honestly that we've thought we can't do this anymore yeah. <laughs> because we really we're, we're trying to keep the quality up and i think it's evolved you know it's definitely changed we used to record it in a studio with multiple guests which was like an as live yeah like which yeah. was which was actually pretty good and some features um, and what we settled for now is sort of longer interviews very much you know not not dissimilar to what to what you're doing and we're getting some great people on and we've got some great content we're we do try to get as many astronauts on as, as we can. I mean, we recently had Matthias Mara and uh, Mike Massimino. The Mike, if you okay. never, if you don't listen to any other <laughs> Space Boffins interview ever, do listen to the January uh, edition interview with Mike Massimino yeah, and the conversation afterwards. Just brilliant. I'm holding brilliant. my. I just kind of cover my face in um, shame. It's just brilliant oh. to do to do these uh, these sorts of things. We also try and do a lot of European and, and UK. Mm-hmm. Yeah stuff we've been lucky America, enough you know i suppose this might be why i don't diss the uk space agency because we are lucky enough to be supported as a podcast by the space agency but actually that's a it's an interesting process because we still have editorial independence and yeah you know they suggest something i say no that'd be really boring for our listeners so we don't do that we do the interesting stuff but it is a way of highlighting the uk in space that's what we've always tried to do is as well as you know we, the last one we got this great interview about the, the space shuttle enterprise and that'll yeah. go down really well. And that was recorded on the um, Intrepid in New York and where we also got the Mike Massimino interview. So it's it's good fun and I'm glad we've kept going, actually. Yeah. And you know, Dave, but not all our listeners know. I think some do now. I think we just didn't even mention it for years and years and years that we're actually married. To each other. To each other, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which uh, may be a help or a hindrance in yeah. discussions because yeah. I think if people maybe don't realise, they'll just sort of think, ooh, that was a bit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, they're bickering. Oh, a little yeah. bit spiky. Yeah. <laughs> so we probably should have made more. Personal, we probably should have made more of it. Yeah. I'm just looking at it. Oh, we actually have a whiteboard of our content that's coming up. Oh, we've got all those, your amazing interviews you recorded. So we're still trying to, something we are trying to do, and that's different, I think, to other podcasts is we're still trying to do location recording. And that's probably because both of us have got radio, BBC radio backgrounds. Yeah. So yeah. we're used to be reporters going out with machines, editing it, putting it all together. And, and so you've got all that content you recorded from in Bremen. Bremen in um, Germany. So, with you the know, European service module. Recently, yeah, they had three European uh, service modules all in the same clean room, including the one that's going um, to put the first human back on the moon in 50 years. So that was wow. really exciting yeah. to go and um, and go and see see that. And in fact, I've, I've just had a piece out on it on um, BBC Future, on the BBC Future website about that visit and, and the people that I interviewed there because it was somebody from NASA, so loads of people from ESA and Airbus. And it was just nice to get back to that going out and about again and actually seeing things. Obviously, you've been out and about when you're, your trip to America to go. It it really does make a difference. And we, um, yeah, I do enjoy that. And obviously, the pandemic put a lot of that completely on hold. And while it's brilliant that you can still get people, and in some ways, it can make it easier to get guests because you're not having to book, you know, a studio somewhere and get yeah. to arrange something. It can be really, the production can be quite horrendous with that. This is so much easier because people, I've done interviews with people, and you can obviously tell they're in like the kitchen or they're in the, in a hotel bedroom or something like that. And, and that's okay because we just want audio so that's the advantage but um it is so nice to be out and about which is why we do like getting out and about as much as as possible and i think you know we're we're going to uh, carrying on at the moment i think the great thing about podcasts is if you're a space fan you're it's not like a radio program where you'll favor one over another you'll probably have favorites but you'll listen to all of them yeah so you'll listen to space and things you'll hopefully listen to space boffins you might the other podcasts we make uh super massive podcasts for the royal astronomical society yeah um you know you'll listen to all these you just consume all these 
all these ones. And I think that's brilliant. And actually, I quite like that. Yes, there's like there's overlap, obviously. And you're two similar interviews. Yeah. Where, you know, you might interview the same person. But of course, you know, if people who are interested in this stuff, they don't mind that. And at people all. get different things out of yeah. different people as well. You'll ask better questions, I'm yeah, sure. Than yeah. I do. Yeah. I'm not Anyone sure how. <laughs> different questions. <laughs> and I'm just disgracefully frivolous sometimes, and I just can't help seen something do listen to the mic Massimino. <laughs> oh yes something comes out of Interview. my mouth which i yeah. haven't quite meant to say yeah like with mike Massimino. mike is wonderful well, it was a bit <laughs> awkward afterwards i have to say <laughs> but, yeah, anyway you have to listen to the podcast to um to hear that but yeah i mean we're gonna we're gonna carry on i think and still put it's the uk i think you know a thing that's different about space buffers from its very start is that we will put uk content in it yeah and we're not talking up the uk or you know these are genuinely interesting things going on in the uk and europe that perhaps don't get the coverage in us based space podcasts and it's nice to know that we do have us listeners actually yeah that's really when you know remember when we first years ago and we looked because we just assumed it would just be uk and it was like oh my goodness yeah. those people from the states oh there's australia oh some India, you know, it's just great. To, so that to was our, that. that was our original pitch, you know, because we we got some grant funding to start the podcast, and it was going to be, you know, it's a UK space podcast, and obviously it's evolved, evolved during that time. I think the other thing we've been very lucky with is that uh, we now both write for BBC Future, the BBC Future website. I'm one of only two of the original writers on the on the site still writing for it. As a result of that, we've got some cross pollination between. You know, space boffins. I could do an interview for space boffins that could then feed into something I do for future, or future could sometimes feed into space boffins. So uh, it gives us something a, a bit bigger sometimes than just uh, what we can do on space boffins. But we're going to carry on. Good. If, if only want... we could make masses of money. I know. Bit, that's the, there that's is the, the stuff, just that the one. The, that is the stumbling <laughs> block. You don't have to tell me that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So. Uh, well, that's what I think people appreciate that then. And when, when we started, we basically did say to people, look, this is a labour of love for us. We have full time jobs. Yeah, <laughs> we do do other things, Why? you know, but this is what we I, like. I do, to do find it extraordinary that all the negative reviews you get sometimes on, you know, you put something up there and, you know, you get and you get some negative reviews. You think, well, you're giving, we're giving you this for free. Yeah, you're absolutely. not doing anything. It's not covered it's in very advertising. very rarely, it's... but you're right. When when no, somebody like... says, well, I see you had this interview with that astronaut and you didn't ask them this, or I would have liked yeah. it if you'd have put more that. Yeah. And I just feel like... Start I your own podcast. Insert beep here. <laughs> yeah, insert a beep. beep, beep <laughs> off. Yeah. Beep. yeah. And I, I mean, the plus side of that is you get engagement, you know. Absolutely. Um, which, is, which, is re which is really lovely. And also you get people who are really interested in it because uh, what's happening now over here, as you'll know, is because big broadcasting organisations and big media organisations have now for the last five years thought, oh, podcasts are really popular. Oh, we'll have our own podcast. They get in a huge celebrity name, which infuriates me because you know they are being paid a truckload of bloody money which could have gone into production or could have gone into something, but no, it's just going to that one voice. The real work is done by us, like yeah. and you and Emily, who do the research, who work it all out, who are interested in it and do it. And then someone else <laughs> takes the credit. So, um, and that's the difference, I think, between celebrity-led podcasts and sort of more fan-based ones is at least you know that your presenters are actually really into it. I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. Coming soon, the Tim Peake podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> By it the will. And it will wipe I'm... space boffins to oblivion. Absolutely. And do you know what? He'll be dead to me. <laughs> Next time he says hello, it's just, I'm going to blank him. <laughs> well, we always, when, when, we're in, when we're in bookshops, we see his book. Oh, um, God. We did it. We did it recently in Glasgow. Yeah. So we've had a few books out on, um, on space. Uh, the Year in Space from the Supermassive podcast. And there's the Wally a, a, a Waterstones in Glasgow. And uh, Wally Funk's book was there on the same shelf. Yeah. And uh, my book on, on space, space dogs, dogs was there. And they're all and together. And Peaks. there was Tim Peake's yeah. book. And what we did was we took Tim Peake's book and we hid it behind <laughs> us. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes what we've done on social media, when, when, particularly when the Wally Funk book came out and, and Space Dogs was also out at the same time. So we were doing little book tours and, and stuff. And so was Tim. 
and I would actually troll him on on Twitter and and have a picture which showed first of all the shelf with all the books there, and then I'd show him another picture of the second shelf with our book covering his, and, and it, cut, <laughs> it got really he, he really got into the banter, didn't he? I'm sort of, what are you lot? I'm sort of, I'm sort of I mean, I don't think he really has to worry because his yeah, books sold an awful lot more than any of our books have. <laughs> I'm sure. yeah, I think he's safe. I think yeah. he's fine. For goodness yeah. sake, you shouldn't have even mentioned he should present a podcast. That will give him. I well, actually, with a bit of luck, he won't be allowed to do it when he gets his ambassador. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm surprised. Yeah, sponsored not, by Frau Rocher. Yeah. Done it already. <laughs> That's it. We will be. That it will. That would be the death knell. But no, we just say right. We're off. We're off. That's yeah. it. I think we'll stop. We'll stop doing space muffins when it stops being fun. You know, yeah, I think absolutely. That's the, that's the that's the bottom line. Yeah, I've said the same about this for sure. You know, and I I really enjoy, you know, interviewing you know the people you speak to. It's great. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the point where I'm actually set up and recording and actually doing it is so fun, and you learn yes. so much that that you always think, well, why would I give that up? It's such a g- yes. great time. Yeah, exactly. And isn't it lovely when you get to speak or meet to people that you just say, wow, yeah, that, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a good Absolutely. feeling. It's yeah. Good, and we get yeah. sent free books. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even I do. It's amazing. I'm loving that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for spending some time with us again. This oh, has been no, you're wonderful. Welcome. It's lovely. It's great to put some focus on on the UK, I think. And, uh, and hopefully our, our listeners who aren't from the UK may have. Uh, given some yeah. thought to our small island and, and, and maybe come over and have a visit. But thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. You're Thanks for having welcome. us. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, Houston, we've got a reading here that says you're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. Over. All right. Well, that was really illuminating for me. Um, not being from the United Kingdom, not being British, uh, that was really illuminating. It, it, I, it was very hysterical how they sort of portrayed the British space program like, all right, we had one success, so let's just, uh, that's it. Let's just wrap it. <laughs> you know, very, poli- very polite space program. Very polite, very in line with my experience with people from the United Kingdom. No, seriously, though. Um, it was really fascinating to hear about the history of British space programs and, and where the future is really headed, you know, and, and as far as I think it's really cool that the United Kingdom has independent spaceports. That's really cool. Obviously, we have a few spaceports in the United States, but I think it's really cool that kind of independent spaceports are popping up over the United Kingdom. That's really a cool thing. Um, and I think that will be great for the not just the space flight economy of the UK, but just the general economy of the UK. And of course, I'm excited to see more British astronauts fly on the ISS and, and beyond. That's going to be really cool. I really didn't know the richness and the heritage of the entire program, you know, the history of it. That's the side that's very fascinating to me is like how far it stretches back. I think a lot of people probably think, oh, well, the space program there probably began when Helen Sharman went to space, which is, you know, which is a pretty formidable achievement. But I think the space program in the UK really extends to late World War II, you know, which is you know, way far back than people would imagine. It's just really a fascinating topic. I learned a lot that I did not know. I also heard the word Skynet. That was really exciting. (laughs) That's a great name for a program. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, whoever came up with that, that's brilliant. That's a great, um, that's a beautiful name for a satellite or for a satellite program. So yeah, it was really a a fascinating talk. And I learned a lot that I honestly did not know. Yeah, it's weird. Even in the UK, we don't learn about this history in school. Well, I never did. Someone might have done, but I never did. I've become aware of it because they've got one of the rockets at the Science Museum and that made me think more about it. But even then, the display doesn't really tell you too much. Don't get me started on the Science Museum. Anyway, (laughs) I agree with you about it's great that the UK is going to have um, some independent spaceports within the UK. And I hope that the decision-making process around where those are have been thought out carefully. Because there is a darker side to the British launches that happened in the late 60s and early 70s, which was, they, they took place in Woomera, which is in Australia. Um, mm-hmm. And if you were to read Dr. Alice Gorman's book, uh, about space archaeology, Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe. There's a really, because she's Australian and, and her history was 
her background was looking up artifacts to do with Aboriginal heritage. And essentially, the British government did what they've done for centuries at that point and okay. went in completely ignoring any cultural relevance of the past and heritage and very much the old use of the colonies and we'll do what we want. And they found somewhere that yeah. which worked for their purposes, out of sight, out of mind, but actually Woomera probably shouldn't have been used as a spaceport. Yeah. Uh, again, let's celebrate the fact that Britain had a successful rocket, but there's a darker side to it. You have to give both sides of these things, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. Definitely worth checking out Dr. Alice's Gorman book, book about that. Um, or visit in the Science Museum to see the Black Arrow rocket that they have there, because that's pretty cool as well. And it's, it's good to hear that we were kind of ahead of our time in terms of wanting to launch small satellites. Yeah. And, and you just think, God, if only we'd done that instead of Concorde. Think about where we would be now in terms of as a global player within the space flight. Yeah. We're certainly now playing catch up with and doing okay but it's an exciting time to be in the uk and following space flight i love sue and richard what a wonderful couple they are yes the way they talk to each other the way they communicate the way they cut across each other and on their podcast and the way they were with us just now it's so much fun i enjoy it so uh thank you yes to the two of them for joining us once again i'm sure we'll have them on again yeah, we'll oh, find yeah. other things to talk to them about because they are wonderful. And as always, the unedited uh, video will be on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. Coming at you hotter than a hunk of Skylab over Australia, you're listening to Space and Things. So, Emily, what caught your eye in space flight since last week? Yeah, uh, I just saw this article, uh, I should say this morning, Apparently, NASA astronaut Lieutenant Commander Johnny Kim is outdoing everybody again. He <laughs> has been uh, designated as a naval aviator, and this gentleman also uh, is a Navy SEAL and a doctor and an astronaut as well. So if you ever want to feel like garbage about yourself, just read this guy's biography. It's insane. <laughs> That's really all I've got. Uh, congratulations to Lieutenant Commander Kim for achieving this uh that's amazing and and really that this guy has achieved so much it, it just caught my eye because this guy cannot stop achieving stuff i mean it's just crazy and i hope we i hope we see him go to the moon i'm almost certain we will at some point that would be awesome and what about you dave what have you been looking at well, uh, I'd like to give a shout out to James Franklin for drawing to our attention an article about New Horizons, the spacecraft, in, t in which they're talking about the idea that NASA's science mission directorate is soliciting proposals to end the New Horizons planetary mission five years early and turn it into a heliospheric mission with a new team at the helm. So I don't know what all this means yet. I've read the article, don't understand it, but it's really interesting that they're thinking about repurposing a spacecraft that's that far away. So it's something we're going to look into and potentially we're going to talk about this over the next few weeks. But obviously... As we talked about last week, ESA's Juice mission got off to a great start, and that was great to see. There's been a spacewalk on the ISS, and that's always fun to watch. But, of course, the big story was down in Boca Chica in Texas, where SpaceX have been trying to get their first orbital launch of Starship on the way. It, they had an attempt on Monday. Unfortunately, they had to scrub, but they did manage to do a full wet dress rehearsal, much like I predicted last week would happen. Uh... It's nice to be right at least once. Anyway, it looks like they're going to have another go at that over the next few days. So fingers crossed they managed to get away. The reason why it didn't go yesterday was because I think I was watching it. I was watching the live feed. I think I cursed. <laughs> the old curse exactly. is back. Exactly. <laughs> it's back. I was watching it and then I was like, God dang it. No, I'd rather them just get it right. I, I when Yeah, they, same. Yeah, when they announced the scrub, I was like, I get it. This is a big deal, yeah. so I totally get it. The symmetry between that and the first SLS launch attempt scrub is amazing as well. And there seems to be a lot less people mad about this one, this valve, I know, right? than there was about the valve for SLS. Anyway, we're not going there today, but it's just an observation. Yeah, yeah, I observe that too. I wanted to put it on Twitter, but I'm, I'm not that petty, so... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to change my ways, so I didn't put it on Twitter. I wanted to call people out for that, but I was like, mm, maybe not. 
So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's whether you can be bothered having a discussion over and over again, isn't it, on Twitter? So exactly. I don't blame you for not wanting to. Exactly. But yeah, so that's what's caught my eye this week. I'll put links to those things and the article that Emily talked about in the show notes. Remember, when you're sleeping in space, no one can hear you dream. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining us once again. I know I say this pretty much every week, but please do consider joining our Patreon page, which you can find at patreon.com forward slash space and things. The more the merrier, and it really does make a huge difference for us. We started something new on there last week, which is now going to be a monthly feature. More about that in a few weeks on the podcast, but if you're a member already and you missed that announcement, make sure you log in to find out more. And please keep sharing what we do with your friends, but don't forget, in space, no one can hear you mean. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney.